Hello, and welcome to today's university-based Child and Family Policy Consortium webinar. My name is Rosa Polito, and I am the Policy Assistant at the Society for Research and Child Development, SRCD, as well as the consortium staff liaison. We're excited to welcome you to today's webinar, The Effects of the COVID-19 Pandemic on Low-Wage Working Families. Before I turn things over to our speakers, I want to say a few words about the consortium and about using Zoom. Next slide, please. The University-Based Child and Family Policy Consortium is a network of up to 25 university-based institutions, including centers, departments, and programs that have an interest in child and family policy. We are organized around three main purposes. First, to share the latest findings and strategies for conducting policy-relevant research and to facilitate collaboration across our member institutions. Second, to encourage cross-disciplinary undergraduate and graduate training to support the next generation of child and family policy researchers, and third, to foster effective translation between research practice and policy audiences. The consortium is run in collaboration with the Society for Research and Child Development and hosts a number of webinars each year on a variety of topics. If you are interested in learning more about the consortium, having your institution join the consortium, or if you would like to join our listserv, please see the information on this slide. Next slide, please. Just a quick word before we begin about the te technology we are using today. We are using Zoom to host this webinar. All of the attendees are muted. If you have questions for the speakers, please use the Q&A box on your screen to submit them. Today's webinar is being recorded. After it ends, I will be uploading it to SRCD's YouTube channel and we'll share that link with all registrants. Please feel free to share the link widely. SRCD also expects that all participants will be considerate and respectful in language and behavior, and you can read more about our code of contact, code of conduct using the link in the chat. And now I'll turn it over to Leslie to introduce today's topic and speak. Thank you, Rose, and welcome everyone. My name is Leslie Babinski, and I'm an associate research professor and director of the Center for Child and Family Policy at Duke University. I'm joined today by Dave Rebar from Georgia State University, who will be moderating our discussion today. And I'm pleased to introduce our speaker, my colleague at Duke University, Dr. Anna Gassman Pines. Anna is Associate Professor of Public Policy and Psychology and Neuroscience in the Duke Sanford School of Public Policy and a faculty affiliate in the Center for Child and Family Policy. Anna received her doctorate in Community and Developmental Psychology from New York University. Her research focuses on the development of low-income children in the United States and how parents' experiences outside the home, like in low-wage workplaces, labor markets, accessing social services, spill over to the home and affect family functioning and child well-being. And she'll be sharing some of this work with us today. Dr. Gasman Pines has received awards for both research and teaching, including Mid-Career Award for Outstanding Contributions to Children, Youth, and Families, from the American Psychological Association and the Victoria S. Levin Award for Early Career Success in Young Children's Mental Health Research from the Society for Research and Child Development. Anna's research has been funded by the National Science Foundation and the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development, in addition to several foundations. Please join me in welcoming Anna Gaspin Pines. Thank you so much, Leslie, for that really kind introduction. And thank you all for being here today. It's a pleasure to get a chance to speak with you about the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic on low-wage working families. And I really look forward to having um, a robust conversation at the end of my presentation. I do wanna start by acknowledging that um, all of this work was really conducted uh, jointly and in collaboration with my colleague, Elizabeth Ananat, who is in the economics department at Barnard College. So um, today I'm gonna to be really focusing on service workers with young children. And you might be wondering why should we study service workers with young children? Uh, there are several reasons. Service workers with young children are where the conflict between the ideal worker who is always available for work and doesn't get paid when not needed and the laissez-faire approach of the United States towards how families meet their own care needs reaches arguably its most unnavigable point. Labor activists have been arguing this for years, but policy responses have been minimal and piecemeal. 
Uh, meanwhile, service work has continued to grow as a form of employment in the United States. So in this figure, the red line uh, that is trending down over time is employment in uh, manufacturing, which typically was a sector that um, provided uh, stability in both hours and earnings. And the blue line that's trending up over time is employment in uh, service industries. So you can see that uh, over the last uh, several decades, work in the service sector has grown tremendously in the United States. Uh, service work is characterized by high levels of unpredictability and instability in work schedules and therefore in take home pay. And research from developmental science suggests that these aspects of work pose risks for both families and children. Policymakers uh, have been actively intervening in characteristics of these jobs because of public concerns about risks to the well being of both workers and their children. And uh, the, the types of policies that have been considered include um, so-called schedule stability or fair work week laws that were passed in several major cities and one state prior to the pandemic um, that were kind of gaining traction in the lead up to the pandemic but have, have stalled because of how overwhelming the effects of the pandemic have been on both uh, employment and health. So the original goal of the project that I'm going to be describing to you today uh, was actually about these broader issues around unpredictability and instability in work schedules uh, in, low, in uh, service jobs, how um, daily schedule disruptions affect workers and their families' well-being on a daily basis, and whether laws regulating unstable scheduling practices might help um, families either by reducing unpredictability, uh, improving worker well-being, or might have unintended uh, consequences that don't support family well-being. Uh, when we started doing this work with these goals in mind, we realized that there weren't any existing data sets that would allow us to uh, pursue each of, of these uh, broad goals that we needed a panel of families that we could follow over time in service jobs um, who could report about their experiences on a daily basis because it's, it's at the daily level that um, parents are experiencing instability and unpredictability in their work hours and their work schedules and having to juggle work schedules um, and childcare. And that's, that's a really important time scale at which both the causes and cons consequences of instability occur. Um, so we did initial pilot work in Emeryville, California that I'll talk a little bit about. Emeryville is a small walkable city of about 15,000 people in the Bay Area, kind of wedged in between Berkeley, Oakland, and the Bay with areas of very dense retail and food service. Um, and Emeryville has uh, several progressive labor policies, including a fair workweek ordinance that was aiming to regulate unstable work schedules uh, that was implemented in July of 2017. And I'll talk quite a bit more about venue, venue time sampling in just a moment, but um, in this pilot work in Emeryville, we recruited just about 100 workers with a child aged two to seven and followed them over the course of the rollout um, of this uh, policy change. And what we found in Emeryville is that um, compared to the same families on days when work went as expected, on days with work disruptions, workers had worse mood and reported worse sleep quality. Before and after the law change, um, compared to workers in control firms, workers in treated firms had fewer work disruptions in the post period after the implementation of that law and better sleep quality, but also worked fewer shifts. So in this uh, current study that I'm gonna be talking quite a bit about, we switched settings to the city of Philadelphia, um, which is uh, one of the largest uh, cities in the US, one of the top 10 in population. It is a diverse and multiracial city that is much more typical uh, of many cities in the US than Emeryville in terms of its labor policies and regulations in the sense that um, it has not been on the leading edge of uh, a set of progressive labor policies like some other cities have, uh, still has the federal minimum wage, um, but did pass um, the fair work week standard 
in late 2018, uh, which was originally scheduled to go into effect on January 1st of 2020, and provided us with, because of its size, an opportunity to conduct a large scale evaluation uh, to get at these big picture goals. Um, so how do you recruit hourly service workers with young children? And this um, is probably a helpful conversation to have for a lot of us in the room, whether we're interested in service workers or other unrostered, uh, hard to reach populations. Uh, the strategy that we chose is to use venue based, a venue based sampling approach. And a venue based sampling approach is, is really helpful uh, for generating representative samples when your uh, population of interest is in locations that you know about and can identify. And in our case, we were particularly interested in service workers who are in um, retail stores, in food service establishments, and in hotels. So those are settings that are identifiable. We were uh, lucky enough to partner with the Earth Institute at Columbia University that provided us with a list of all of those businesses that fell into those categories in the entire city of Philadelphia, which we were then able to map. And so what you see on the right here, um, the shaded area are different, uh, is, is the city of Philadelphia. The different colors are uh, different social services districts within uh, the city that are that are defined by the city itself, but anything shaded uh, is is in the city limits and all those little black dots are uh, retail food service or hotel businesses in in the city itself. So how does uh, participant recruitment via venue based sampling work. We subdivided the city into uh, smaller areas with a walking route. So here on the right, I've zoomed in to um, uh, kind of center city and, and the uh, north uh, part of North Philadelphia. And you can see one such walking route here on the right. Each day we assigned a walking route to a recruiting team or a set of teams with a randomly seated start business and a walking direction. So in this map, every blue pin was a retail food service or hotel business within that walking route that might have been assigned to a recruiting team on a particular day. And so, for example, uh, now I've zoomed in even more to show you the details behind that uh, area with the blue pins. So, for example, research staff might have been assigned to start on a particular day at the Dunkin Donuts, which here is circled in red, and to walk through this route in a generally uh, counterclockwise direction. And at each business, so at each one of those blue pins, the research staff went into the business and tried to talk to any available workers who happened to be working uh, at that business at that particular time um, and to try to assess eligibility with the main eligibility criteria being that uh, that worker had a child between the ages of two and seven. Uh, this process was repeated daily uh, for the months of October, uh, August, September and October 2019. Um, which resulted in us being able to uh, fully saturate the city uh, with project staff at some point during that three month period so that each business was visited at least once during that three month period with recruitment happening um, on all days of the week and at most times of day. We did not recruit um, during any overnight hours. Um, so we didn't recruit anyone who happened to, uh, we, we did not send research staff um, to these businesses uh, overnight, but we did start in the early morning and went well into the evening. So during this three month period, our project staff talked with over 12,000 service workers across the city. Um, of those identified, uh, just under 1,800 eligible workers who had a child in that age range, and then successfully recruited um, a, a little over 1,100 of them. So uh, the majority of eligibles agreed to participate in the study. And we uh, argue that this process, from what we can tell, is a plausibly representative sample of hourly service workers with children age two to seven, uh, with the caveat that these are folks who are working in public facing roles. So if someone was working as a line cook in the back, it would be very hard for our project staff to talk to that person. Or if someone was working in a stock room in the back, um, it, would, it was pretty hard for our research staff to talk to those folks. So uh, we are probably missing some folks in roles that don't have them in a public facing um, uh, position. And um, our team, uh, 
spoke English and Spanish. All of our study materials were available in English and Spanish, but what that does mean is that we are missing some workers um, who spoke other languages in the Philadelphia context that is um, primarily folks who speak Chinese or Vietnamese. Uh, what does this sample look like? Um, consistent with being in uh, hourly service positions in a, a large urban setting, these are largely folks um, from uh, racially and ethnically minoritized groups. Um, the vast majority of our sample uh, identify as women. Um, uh, don't have a lot of education on average beyond a high school education and uh, are, uh, have a low in income. So on average, um, our participants reported um, household income of about uh, $2,200 a month. The focal child who was between ages two and seven were uh, five years old on average and uh, half reported by their parents to be uh, girls. And then what was our strategy for capturing uh, these families' daily lived experiences, which was one of the really important goals of the project? Uh, we did this using basic SMS text messaging capabilities. Uh, so we uh, asked the survey questions of these participants um, using text messages and received their answers using text messages. This was all automated by a third party service. And we um, captured lived experiences at three different points in time uh, for four weeks in fall of 2019, for two weeks in the winter of 2020, and for another four weeks in the fall of 2020. Work, questions about work asked uh, the parent whether they worked that day, whether they were supposed to, whether they worked, uh, what their hours were, and whether those were the hours that were originally on their schedule. Um, in terms of family well-being, every day we asked about parents' mood, about their interactions with their child, and, and the parents' report about their child's behavior. So how were these families faring prior to the pandemic? Kind of how do we understand the baseline experiences of how these folks were doing before uh, the pandemic? Uh, two key takeaways from this slide. One, um, as I suggested, um, Unpredictable work schedules are incredibly common uh, among this group of families. So of all the days that we observed in the fall of 2019, 10% of days had some kind of unexpected change in a work schedule, whether that was hours being shortened, hours being lengthened, shifts being canceled, shifts being added on at the last minute without prior notice. 10% um, of days isn't uh, a lot of days, but that's three days a month when work schedules did not go uh, as planned. Um, in terms of family well-being, um, parents reported that they had negative mood on nearly 40% of days uh, before the pandemic uh, was even a glimmer in anyone's eye in the fall of uh, 2019. Uh, so as they were juggling uh, so many work uh, challenges, um, a lot of feelings of uh, negative mood that was quite common. Um, parents report about their children feeling worried or their children being uncooperative were much less common. So they uh, reported their children being worried only 1.5% of days and children being uncooperative, uh, which can be a sign of uh, distress in young children on just over 4% of days. So in terms of understanding the consequences of uh, schedule unpredictability for families, we ran a, a basic regression with family fixed effects, which basically um, compares for the same family, how do things go on a day when everything goes as planned for parents' work schedules compared to on, on a day when work schedules change in an unexpected way for that same family. And what we found is that before the pandemic, uh, parents felt much worse, had much worse mood on days with an unexpected work schedule change. So that um, compared to days when work went as originally planned or as the parent had thought, um, uh, uh, negative mood increased by eight percentage points uh, on days when uh, those parents had a, had a work schedule change. But we did not um, observe any changes in reports of parenting behavior or parents' reports about their child's behavior. And this suggests suggests that parents may actively buffer their children from work stress. 
In our evaluation of Emeryville's policy, we found that a, that a schedule stability regulation can reduce unpredictability. And so here, um, the folks in, in who are working in businesses that uh, would be regulated uh, started out having more unpredictability in their schedules, and then that dropped and looked more like the control firms after that policy went into effect. So what happened to these families during the COVID-19 pandemic? Um, First, we found that the initial uh, crisis phase was a very hard time for working families. So we actually were in the field doing this daily data collection starting on February 20th of 2020. Um, and what, what you can see here, the orange line is the percent of parents who reported that they worked that day. And so that has this kind of very, um, even up and down pattern. And that's because um, even in service jobs where uh, people might need to work any day of the week, uh, folks are less likely to work on weekends than they are on weekdays. And so you see this kind of uh, up and down pattern look pretty consistent. Um, a, an index of family mental health that includes both parents and children look reasonably flat. Um, that red line is when the COVID restrictions went into place, when the um, city of Philadelphia announced the closure of schools, uh, the closure of non-essential businesses, the state of Pennsylvania uh, declared a public health emergency. And what we could see um, almost in real time as we were collecting these data what, were two things. One, how quickly parents um, lost access to work. So that orange line just drops way down. Uh, as soon as those restrictions are put into place, which is not surprising because uh, many folks were working in non-essential businesses like retail stores. Um, and at the same time, family mental health also declined uh, quite quickly following the announcement of those um, extreme public health measures. This pattern was not unique to Philadelphia. So these are two um, figures from a different project actually in a rural area in central Pennsylvania. Um, showing uh, with a very similar uh, setup where we're looking at parents' reports about their own mood on a daily basis. And the red line similarly is when those same restrictions went into place. And as you can see, parents' reports about feeling angry and irritable jumped up and stayed elevated uh, in the spring of 2020 after those restrictions. Parents' feelings of worry and depression also jumped up and did uh, trend a little bit down. So at that point, when we saw these patterns, we pivoted our project and have added data collection focused on experiences during the pandemic, um, really for the last two years. So I'm going to present kind of a series of lessons um, from this work. As I mentioned, lesson one is that the initial crisis was a very hard time for families. Um, what we found is that many families experienced um, a variety of different types of stressors related to the pandemic. So um, that included having an adult in the household laid off, having a loss of income, having caregiving burden related to both children uh, or elder parents, and having uh, a household member uh, be ill. These were uh, common experiences that were strongly related to parents' own mood, but the accumulation of these hardships um, in the spring of 2020 uh, uh, was related both to parents' own mood, the quality of their sleep, and how they reported that their children were doing. So in families that were experiencing three or four of these COVID hardships, uh, parents not only felt worse, but they also were reporting that their children were more worried and their children were more uncooperative. Um, the second lesson is that uh, the ongoing difficulties throughout the pandemic have been unevenly addressed by policy remedies. There's a lot to say here, and I hope we can talk more about it um, in the Q&A. The first thing I'll show is that um, uh, uh, everyone has not regained access to employment. Um, so in this figure, um, the top uh, teal line is the percent of our sample who uh, reported being employed over time throughout the pandemic. The um, dark orange line is the percent uh, who reported being unemployed. So that is uh, out of uh, not working, but looking for work. And then the, the gray line is the percent uh, who reported being out of the labor force. So although unemployment has decreased for the um, parents in our sample and employment has ticked back up. Uh, remember, these were folks where everyone was employed at the beginning 
um, because that's how they got into the study in the first place. And still, um, by fall of 2021, uh, just over 70% of our uh, parents in our sample were employed. And that's in part due to an increase in the percent of parents who reported to us that they were not in the labor force, that gray line. So slightly over 10% um, had, had left the labor force. And that uh, is largely driven by increased uh, caregiving responsibilities for children. Among those who were employed in um, April 2020, income from work was relatively stable between June and November. Um, so this is in the, the first year of the pandemic. And I'm gonna show you a series of figures that have uh, this, the, the bars have the same meaning. Um, here, pink or red means that, that the parent reported a loss of income um, with the pinkish being uh, lost less than half their income, the red being the more severe, lost more than half their income. Uh, the light green is the parent reported stable income and the dark green is actually a higher income, so an increase in income. So for those who remained employed, um, income from work uh, was relatively stable through this period, although a lot of folks had lost uh, income from work, uh, whether because they had fewer hours, uh, took home fewer tips and so forth. Um, but among those who were unemployed in April, 2020, income losses from work were much larger throughout 2020. Um, so uh, not surprisingly, when you lose, uh, when you lose access to work, uh, you, you lose the income that you would have otherwise gotten from work. So here, those pink and red are much taller, much, much more income loss among the group that, uh, that was unemployed early on. In June of 2020, Government supports were helping buffer all families from large income losses. So uh, in June of 2020 was when um, Congress had passed a set of supports that expanded um, unemployment insurance that started getting uh, that initial round of um, cash payments out to families, the so-called stimulus payments. Um, there was a big push to try to uh, support folks during this unprecedented crisis. And we do see evidence um, that that was helpful in buffering families. So on the left two set of bars here um, are those who were employed. And so, uh, and, the, and among, uh, among those two bars, uh, the one on the left is income from work and the one on the right is income from work plus additional supports from the government. So when we ask parents to think about what additional supports they were getting from the government, that pink and red shrinks, income losses shrink, and the green, light green and dark green, gets bigger. So that is evidence that those government supports were helping to buffer those families. Um, among those who were unemployed, same pattern. Uh, so when we asked uh, parents to think about both income from work and these other government supports, that pink and right on the, on the right side of the screen shrinks. But those supports, as you might remember, were temporary and had uh, had largely faded by September of 2020. So when we try to look for evidence that, uh, that uh, the taking away of those supports or the phase out of that initial response, uh, what difference did that make? You can see that uh, across those who were employed and unemployed, uh, those uh, income losses look pretty similar, whether it's just income from work or including government supports, because those government supports had largely ended by September of 2020. And furthermore, these pandemic benefits that did buffer income loss uh, did not reach everyone and importantly did not reach everyone equally. So I'm gonna spend a couple of minutes uh, here talking about unemployment insurance, which is our major policy for supporting people who have lost uh, uh, jobs, who have been laid off and was made much more generous during the pandemic, both in terms of uh, eligibility. So uh, who could actually apply for and receive unemployment insurance and in terms of the size of the benefit. So in our, um, in our data, across the two years of data collection of the workers who were laid off at any given point in time, uh, the vast majority of them did apply for UI. So in our sample, about 90% applied for unemployment insurance. Um, of those who applied though, only two thirds reported at the time that they were surveyed that they had received their UI check. 
And of those who had received their UI check, um, uh, only 80% reported that they had received the supplemental benefits, the extra either $600 or $300 um, additional benefit that was supposed to be included in everyone's check during the pandemic to make uh, unemployment insurance more generous. So this is the overall pattern. But really importantly, uh, we observed uh, large differences between the uh, white workers in our sample and those who are in racial and ethnically minoritized groups. So that UI receipt was quite uneven across groups. And I want to call your attention to um, a couple different things. In our sample, um, first of all, those who identified as Hispanic were much less likely to apply for UI than either those who identify as black or those who identify as uh, non-Hispanic white folks. Um, so the vast majority of black and white parents in our sample who were laid off applied for UI. Um, that was much less uh, the case for those Hispanic parents, um, likely because of concerns about public charge, um, engaging with uh, government uh, officials uh, and, um, and concerns about immigration status. Um, but then among those who, who apply, uh, both the Black parents and the Hispanic parents were substantially less likely than the white parents in our sample to report having received their UI check at the time that we surveyed them. And so these are folks who, are, who were similarly situated at the beginning of the pandemic in terms of having similar age children and were in similar uh, workplaces. Um, and yet, uh, the uh, workers of color were much less likely than the white workers in our sample to have actually gotten um, their UI check at the time that they were surveyed. Um, we didn't see differences in having received, statistically significant differences in having received the supplement, but when you kind of total all of this up together and say, okay, what percent of the laid off uh, workers received the full benefits to which they should have been uh, entitled, uh, there are large racial and ethnic gaps where uh, just about a third of uh, folks who identify as Black or Hispanic reported receiving their UI plus their supplemental benefits, whereas uh, over 50% of the white folks in our sample reported receiving their UI and supplemental benefits. Why don't benefits reach everyone? Um, well, these applications were actually designed to create hurdles. The UI application uh, was designed uh, not to be used during a pandemic, <laughs> and, um, and it's not supposed to be easy because the idea is that only people who really need it uh, should, should get it, and so it was designed to have hurdles. The systems themselves that process payments are antiquated. They often cannot be updated to eliminate the hurdles, um, say, during a public health emergency, or to otherwise enact more reasonable new policies when needed. And additionally, offices are understaffed. Uh, much, this is an area where much more research is needed to understand where the disconnects occur and how best to address them. Um, we're starting to do this work by partnering with my colleague here at the Duke Stanford School, Carolyn Barnes, who's an expert in administrative burden, to learn more about our respondents' experiences with uh, both UI and other safety net programs. Um, and how those experiences differed uh, for uh, uh, people with different racial and ethnic groups. We also saw um, a substantial uptick in food insecurity during uh, the COVID pandemic. Um, so remember that these were folks who were uh, had low incomes even before the pandemic. And so in February of 2020, before uh, the pandemic, um, 20. Uh, Four percent of our respondents reported be, being worried about running out of uh, having enough having enough money uh, to uh, pay for food. That they were worried that their food would run out and they wouldn't have enough money to to buy more. And twenty two percent reported that they had actually had food run out in the last thirty days. So uh, that's those are high indicators of food insecurity even before the pandemic. Those uh, increased drastically uh, during the pandemic part of 2020. And then we actually do see evidence that those uh, that food insecurity started falling again um, when additional substantial policy interventions were made. So the American Rescue Plan, uh, which sent out another round of stimulus checks and then 
when the child tax credit uh, was rolled out in the summer of 2021 and families with children started receiving monthly payments, um, we see that food insecurity at that point began to drop back down. So that's not a causal story, just a descriptive one, but consistent with um, other evidence, including by my colleague, uh, Liz Ananat, showing that these um, substantial policy investments, um, especially these uh, infusions of cash for families, did really make a difference for families' food insecurity. Uh, the third lesson is that the pandemic has taken a severe toll on mental health. We observe chronic mental health struggles um, in our sample. In fall of 2020, nearly half of the parents in our sample screened positive for, both, for either major depression, generalized anxiety, or both. 17% of parents reported at that time that their children were sad or worried the majority of the time. And we have some evidence um, from fall of 2020 that a very chaotic schooling and childcare situation may have been a significant driver of some of the mental health challenges that parents in our sample were reporting. So in, in the fall round of daily surveys, we asked about disruptions in school and care to try to get a sense of um, was that a day when things went smoothly with childcare and school or was it not? And what we found is that school and childcare disruptions were incredibly common throughout the fall of 2020. So this was a time when uh, school district of Philadelphia was entirely remote. So um, any children who were kindergarten age or older were uh, in uh, virtual school. Um, and then some childcare centers were open, but it was somewhat of a patchwork. And so what you can see is that um, in the early fall of uh, 2020, uh, parents were reporting some kind of disruption to, to schooling or childcare uh, over 25% of uh, the time, sometimes over 30% of the time. That fell a little bit throughout the fall, but still remained quite high. This was, these were incredibly common experiences. And they were uh, common across learning mode. So uh, across all the days that we observed in fall of um, 2020, parents reported a disruption to school or care on 24% of days. Um, uh, but even for um, families who were in in-person childcare, uh, parents were reporting uh, disruption to that care over 17% of days. Um, and, uh, and the most uh, chaotic was when parents had children in both in-person and remote uh, modes of learning. Um, furthermore, we found that family well-being is worse on days with a, was worse on days with a disruption to school or childcare. So um, the, the bottom part of the bars with the white numbers is what parents reported on day when, uh, when school or care went uh, smoothly. And then uh, the the darker bit of the bars with the black lettering is the increase in uh, child uncooperativeness, sadness, worry, um, parent losing their temper and parent uh, negative mood on days when school is disrupted. So when, when school or child care got disrupted, that was incredibly stressful for both parents and children. And these fall 2020 disruptions were linked to parents' preferences and perceptions in spring of 2021 as that uh, school year uh, wrapped up. The more disruptions families had experienced in fall, the more they wanted to switch their mode of learning or care in, in the spring, and the less they reported that their children had learned throughout the school year. When we asked them to look back, the more disruptions they had had in fall, uh, the, 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 the less they reported that their children had learned during that school year. So one of the main implications here is that parents and children will likely need mental health supports to recover not only from kind of the big T traumas of the pandemic, like knowing someone who is ill, knowing someone who has died from COVID, um, having uh, daily life be, you know, ground to a halt and entirely disrupted, but also the accumulation of these daily stressors as parents and children kind of went about um, uh, going, going back to what daily life was supposed to be, there was still uh, tremendous numbers of disruptions and stressors uh, from one day to the next that likely accumulated in ways 
um, that suggests that both parents and children are going to need additional mental health supports going forward. So in terms of our own next steps, and I hope to talk with all of you about what you imagine some next steps uh, might be and what else we could uh, learn. We have plans to compare program access, school experiences, family functioning, and the well-being of those essential workers. So folks who uh, maintained employment because they were in settings where those businesses stayed open and they continued to work throughout the pandemic. Uh, with those experiences for workers who were laid off to better understand the role of work for these families. So this is, um, you know, an, an, uh, what some of us might refer to as an exosystem where a parent goes off to work, but what happens in that workplace doesn't just stay contained in that workplace, but can spill over and affect um, family dynamics, family functioning, and uh, ultimately child development. And uh, we might imagine that there could be a tension here. So uh, sometimes people talk about, you know, the role modeling of going to work, the dignity of going to work. Was there something about structure, about role modeling or uh, parent self-esteem of being able to maintain employment that was protective for those families? While at the same time, those jobs were very stressful and difficult, especially, uh, especially during the 2020 phase of the pandemic. Um, you know, compared to the experiences of laid off workers who lost that connection to employment, but uh, received more generous um, policy supports than they would have otherwise and might have had additional time to spend with children during what was uh, an incredibly stressful time for, for so many. Um, second, we have plans to dig into our program access data even more uh, to better understand which supports have been accessible and effective and which fall short and for whom. So to continue that work. And uh, finally, to use these findings to identify what a more robust set of social supports for service workers with young children could look like going forward. And I'm gonna um, end here by just giving an enormous thank you to uh, the various um, agencies and foundations that funded this work and made this work possible. And also, uh, the so many members of the uh, research team, both on the ground in Philadelphia, here in Durham at Duke University, um, so many trainees at different levels, graduate students, postdocs, um, none of this wouldn't have been possible without a huge number of really important people doing so much of the work behind the scenes. And I just wanna thank the funders and all of the team members uh, for making this work possible. Anna, thank you uh, so much. Uh, yeah, there's uh, so much uh, that you uh, have uncovered uh, in this, and we're so lucky that you and your team uh, were able to be out in the field and uh, to uh, gather this data in, uh, in real time. It's a fantastic uh, effort. Uh, we had uh, two questions uh, that were submitted uh, prior. Uh, and reminder to uh, the audience, uh, if uh, you have questions, uh, please type them into the Q&A box uh, and I'll uh, read them uh, back to uh, Anna. Uh, the uh, first question uh, that we had uh, concerns uh, outcomes in rural areas. So during your presentation, you did mention some other work uh, that you'd been doing uh, that was in a you know, rural area. And could you talk a little bit about uh, the kinds of policy advice uh, that you'd give uh, that might be different in a rural area uh, as opposed to uh, Philadelphia? Sure, yeah, that's a really important um, question. And I'm, and I'm happy to, to, to say more about that other study that was also in Pennsylvania, but in, in a, a much more rural area in, in central Pennsylvania. Um, one of the um, real challenges in that uh, in that rural uh, setting is, is challenges around um, uh, actual food access and transportation. So in the city of Philadelphia, um, there is, you know, it's much more dense and there's a lot more infrastructure. Uh, in central Pennsylvania, um, it was uh, very hard for families, for example, um, to access uh, food in part because that's an area that is uh, 
where that study is taking place is a was already designated a food desert by the USDA. So that was a challenge even before the pandemic that was made um, even more difficult, uh, uh, especially when those restrictions were put into place. Uh, in that work in central Pennsylvania, we have um, uh, evidence that um, families are accessing public food assistance, but are also using um, uh, nonprofit provided food assistance in really important ways. That's particularly true um, for the Hispanic families in that area. And so during the pandemic in a rural setting, it was uh, very difficult for those nonprofit um, food providers to get that food to families in, in the way that they wanted to and that families needed. So the kind of infrastructure challenges are really different um, in that rural setting. Great, thank you. Uh, the second uh, question uh, asks about whether you found a link in your investigation between uh, you know, parents' uh, changes in mental health due to uh, pandemic-related unemployment and the quality of uh, their child-parent interactions. Yeah, that's a really important um, question that we're still working on. So we did find um, that, uh, uh, and this is very consistent with other literature, so this is you know not new, but um, uh, being laid off is you know quite detrimental for mental health. So in, and that's true in our sample too. So the the parents who reported being laid off um, uh, did have worse mental health than those who maintained employment, just on average. Um, and uh, but the links with the with um, parenting and and how parents reported about their children's behavior were um, you know not not as clear as you might have imagined. So I, and I think this goes back to, um, you know, this kind of buffering that parents, you know, are, are really trying to do um, to um, make efforts to, you know, to try to keep their stress related to their loss of a job, for example, or a stressful thing that's happening on the job from kind of spilling over. Um, we have more work to do to really unpack that, um, but just on average, we don't see, we see big changes in mental health, but we don't see as much um, as big or consistent changes uh, with parenting or parents report about children's behavior. Great. Uh, we had a uh, question that came in from an audience member uh, who asked that you uh, tell us a little bit more about the SMS uh, survey system that you used. Uh, whether uh, that led to any uh, problems or maybe benefits with respect to response rates, and if there was a third party uh, provider, who that third party provider was. Sure. So, um, and to whoever asked the question, I, you know, I, I could, I, I have a lot to say about um, how to do this data collection, and I'd be happy to follow up offline, you know, separately. But briefly, um, uh, we used a service called Mosio, M-O-S-I-O, -O, um, that is based in the Bay Area. And um, one of the benefits of, and, and lots of, there are lots of services that do this. And for those of you who have, um, for example, that your university might have a business agreement with Qualtrics, Qualtrics actually has this functionality as well. The reason that we liked Mosio is that, um, their system works best with the widest range of providers. So, so it's really important um, to, if you're especially going to be trying to gather data from uh, lower income folks that you use, and you want to do this kind of text message data collection, that you use a system that can interface with the widest possible array of mobile providers, because folks use all different kinds of um, providers, you know, uh, uh, like the big ones, you know, like Verizon, but also there's a whole bunch of lower cost kind of pay by the minute, um, localized uh, mobile providers. And we didn't want anyone to be unable to participate because the system didn't talk well with, you know, net 10, which might have been a particular small local uh, provider. So, so that's one really important thing, especially with lower income families. I think this is an excellent way of doing data collection for a couple reasons. 
Um, one is that the, the, I showed you screenshots from my own phone and I have an iPhone, but this works with any kind of mobile phone. It does not have to be a smartphone. As long as that phone can send and receive basic text only text messages, people can participate in this study. It doesn't require an app to be added onto their phone. It doesn't require any data. So it's not using people's um, data, which, which is often, especially for lower income families in pretty short supply. Um, but what we've found is that most folks, the way that their mobile plans work, they tend to have unlimited texting. So just the basic SMS texting isn't eating up uh, their uh, data that, that their plan might have. Um, so that's one benefit. The other benefit um, is that people can do this on their own time and they can start and stop in ways that work for them. So with our daily data collection, the first survey question was sent out each evening at 7 p.m. Uh, local time. And um, as soon as the person answers that question, the second survey question is sent automatically. And that process repeats until the person completes the survey. Um, but that there can be a gap. So it might be that I um, am waiting for the bus, and so I start answering the questions, but then, uh, you know, then the bus gets there and I put my phone away and I uh, don't answer for a while, but I later on put my kids to bed, I can pick up my phone and send back my answer at that point. And the, the, because it's all automated, the questions will, you know, the, the participant can um, complete it at, at a time that works for them. So in terms of um, really trying to be respectful of participants' time and minimize burden. This, uh, I think this achieves those goals really well. Great. Uh, so uh, you uh, presented uh, results that showed uh, pretty profound uh, racial and ethnic differences in UI received. Uh, could you talk about some of the other uh, racial and ethnic differences uh, that you found, uh, you know, maybe with respect to schooling and care disruptions, uh, well-being outcomes, and mental health outcomes? Yeah, so um, uh, with the schooling and care disruptions, you know, in general, it was such a chaotic um, uh, kind of fall semester that there, 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 it is largely a story of consistency. Uh, the early on in fall, however, the um, the folks who identify as Hispanic had the reported the most uh, disruptions, and um, uh, to kind of care in school. And we don't exactly know if that's um, because kind of sorting out the technology of virtual school was you know even more challenging for folks who may not. Um, speak English. And so getting kind of tech support help if that was an issue, which I think it was for a lot of families might have been more challenging. But, um, but the Hispanic identifying families did report slightly more uh, disruptions in that fall semester. But the, in terms of the consequences, what we really see is a, there is a, is a story of, um, uh, you know, really consistent uh, effects across groups. So those days with school and care disruptions were just really hard for everyone. Um, and we also see that for, um, uh, for layoffs and mental health. So a, a pretty consistent story um, of layoffs being really hard on mental health across racial and ethnic groups. We also see that receiving UI um, is uh, helpful for mental health across racial and ethnic groups. But of course we find that uh, the black and Hispanic parents in our sample are less likely to receive UIs. So there remains this uh, inequality there um, because uh, uh, you know, UI benefits were not equally reaching folks. Great. Uh so uh, I'm going to turn things back over to uh, Rose. Uh, Anna, thank you so much uh, for you know, a really uh, fascinating uh, presentation, a timely presentation. Before I turn it back to uh, Rose, uh, I want to uh, thank uh, Leslie for organizing uh, today's uh, seminar 
and the fantastic support team at SRCD uh, who uh, hosted uh, the seminar and uh, made this all run uh, so smoothly. So thank you, uh, everybody. Rose? Great. Thank you, Dave. And of course, thank you, Anna. Um, and thank you again to everyone who joined us today, and especially to our speakers for such a thought-provoking presentation. I think, as we all know, the pandemic is still ongoing, and it's really great to see this research on all the effects and the different policy impl implications. Um, so as I just put in the chat, we welcome your feedback on this webinar. So right after the Zoom closes, there will be a survey link that pops up, and we invite you to fill that out if you'd like to. And we also, um, could you go to the next slide, please? Yes. Um, yes, so oh, the we, next one. Oh, no, this one's good. Okay. Thank you. Um, so we also welcome your ideas for future consortium webinars. So there's kind of two different ways to do it. So if you are associated with a consortium member institutions, you can sign on to SRCD Commons, and that um, web address is on the slide and you can join the consortium community and there is a discussion thread there where you can input your ideas. And then if you're not a member of the consortium, you can email to either of our um, steering committee members. So that's Shaniqua Jeffrey or Dave Rubar. Um, both of their email addresses are also on the slide. Um, next slide, please. And last, um, if you would like to learn more about the consortium or join our listserv, you can visit our website. Um, and that listserv is public, so you don't need to be a member of the consortium, but that listserv will tell you about future webinars as well as other job and event announcements. And in our follow-up email, I will include a link to today's webinar um, as it was recorded and will be posted to SRCD's YouTube channel. And if you have any more questions, you can email me. My email address is rippolito at srcd.org. Um, yes, and thank you again to everyone for joining us, and we hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks so much.